Emergency Broadcast, Crimson Alert, Chapter 6 Even though I was armed with something stronger than a baseball bat, I couldn't stop feeling uneasy. I'd almost been killed by American soldiers, and my life had been saved by a demon. This was absolutely insane. What was I supposed to do now? Had those actually been soldiers, or just something else pretending to be them? If so, why had the demon, Beezlebub, saved me? Had it... had it been a trick? Nah, Grandad said in my head. Fallen angels may be some of the most disgusting and loathsome creatures in God's creation, but at least a few of them have some decency. Some, mind you. Thanks for the advice, Grandad, I muttered. Do you remember some of the stories I used to tell you? Like how I know what the devil's footprints look like? I paused and nodded slowly. Yes, of course, I knew that story. Dad had always dismissed it as just nonsense, but I still listened. I only stopped believing when I got older. It had been one Christmas, the year after Grandad told me what the devil's footprints were. We just had dinner, and Grandad was telling me a story before bed. It was about two giants who built a causeway from Ireland to Scotland so they could have a fight. When one tricked the other, the loser tore up the bridge. Tell me another, Grandad, I said, the eager little boy that I was. A scary one. Scary story, my Grandad said, raising one eyebrow. On Christmas... I nodded, still smiling. Grandad sighed, looked out of the window at the Michigan night, then turned back to me. Okay, I've got a good one, and this is a true story. I sat up in my bed, eyes wide with excitement. Grandad didn't open his mouth, remaining as still as a statue, a far away haunted look in his eyes. Then he spoke. When I was a young lad, just turned 18, I got into the habit of playing cards. At the time, I was living in Belfast, and it was a dangerous time to be there. Black and tans roamed the streets. Unionists would shoot Catholics. Nationalists bombed pubs. Aye, it was a dangerous time. I was in one of the pubs with my friends, drinking, cursing, and gaining or losing money with every hand of cards we played. It was a good crate, until a stranger approached us. He was tall and handsome with dark hair and dark eyes. But when I looked into them, a feeling of dread entered my soul. He asked to join our game, so we led him, and oh, how he played. He was a master of the game, seeming to know exactly what was in our hands before we even saw them. More than one of my friends accused the stranger of cheating, and the stranger just laughed. Still, as good as he was, I knew what I was doing as well. I was the first one who managed to call a bluff of his and take some of his cash. And when I dragged those pound notes and coins towards me, I felt a shiver go up my spine. I looked up. The stranger was staring right at me with those dark eyes. There was this look in them, like a wolf eyeing a lamb. Then he nodded at me with a friendly smirk, like he was challenging me. So I nodded back. Pretty soon it was clear he had it out for me. He ignored my mates, and when he did pay attention to them, he'd rob them blind with a few plays. Pretty soon, none of my friends could keep playing, leaving me and the stranger alone. Then he spoke. He said, Let's make this more exciting. How about this time we bet something aside from our money? So I asked him what we could bet. He laughed and answered, like he was a kid telling an innocent joke. Your soul. The pub went quiet when he said that. And I don't mean everyone stopped talking. I mean completely quiet. Not even a mouse dared make a sound, and the floorboards wouldn't creak. It was so silent, I would have thought we were all dead, and this stranger was smiling with a wicked look in his eyes. I think at that moment, me and my mates realized who we had been playing with. Like I told you, I was young, and like all young men, Stupid. So I smirked and decided to raise the stakes a bit more. All right, I told the stranger. I'll accept your bet, but on one condition. 
If I win, you have to leave the earth. <laughs> the stranger laughed and stuck out his hand as smoothly as a snake uncoiling. I didn't shake it, only looked back at him and nodded. That was the most intense game of my life. I was sweating like a waterfall, while the stranger just coolly shuffled his cards across his fingers, licking his lips every now and then. My friend had shuffled the deck and dealt our hands, and he was sweating more than I was. When I saw the stranger smile at me with a wicked grin, I at first thought for sure I'd lost and wouldn't have long on this earth, until his eyes, ever so briefly, clouded with doubt. It was so quick, I would have missed it if I hadn't have been paying attention. I looked at my own hands. It must have been a miracle from God, because, for the first time in my life, I had four aces. We played our hands. When the stranger played his, it was four aces. He laughed aloud until I played mine. His laughter vanished, and those aces changed into a king, a queen, an eight of spades, and a one. I smirked at him, stood up from my seat, jabbed a finger at the door and said, Get out. Only the stranger didn't. He sat there, body shaking with rage, eyes clouding over. They were changing, shimmering before me like feathers on a crow. You, he said, hissing in a way which would freeze a snake's blood. Cheated. Then I did something really stupid. Nah, I told him. You just had the misfortune of playing against a lucky Irishman. He didn't roar and scream. No, he did something far worse. He slowly stood up from his chair, placed both hands calmly on the table, leaned toward, and hissed through clenched teeth. I never lose, he spat. Never. Not to some ruddy little bastard from Patrick's coven. You'll rue the day you did this to me. You'll know one day what it means to cross my path. When your body is dead and six feet under, I'll have my vengeance. Then he turned around, walking towards the door with heavy steps that could have shattered the floor if he wanted to. When he reached it, he turned around, still snarling at me, with teeth that had become sharp and jagged. Not like any animal on this earth. They were like needles, twisted and bent easily able to rip the flesh from my bones. Then he opened the door, and on the other side, there was nothing. I do mean nothing, lad. There wasn't a road, no rainy weather, no blustering Ulster wind. Not even fire and brimstone. Just nothing. I could have gone mad looking at it. Then the stranger crossed over the threshold, slamming the door shut behind him. And I saw his footprints burn into the floorboards. You remember when I drew you the devil's footprint? I nodded at Grandad's question. Aye, he said slowly. That's how I know what they look like. When I came back to the present, I could feel something looking at me, with the same hatred as from the scars. I almost turned around to check, but I already knew where it was coming from. So I kept walking, trying to ignore as it followed my every step. It was when I reached the end of the trail that I saw it. A meeting house of some kind. One you could mistake for a church were it not for the sign out front. I smiled, relieved, and began walking towards it when I got another buzz from my phone. I pulled it out, checked, and what I saw made my stomach drop. It was a message. Jenny's gone. I answered back instantly. What do you mean she's gone? I took my eyes off her for one second and she's gone, just gone, like she disappeared into thin air. I give her some clothes to change into and then poof, she's gone. I don't know where she went, but look, I'm sorry. I meant what I said earlier, if we don't work together, we won't make it out of this alive. One part of that message in particular caught my eye, and I responded with it in mind. Did, did you give her a tank top and shorts? Yes, how do you know that? Shit. I cried out loud, looking back the way I had come. God damn it, god damn it all! I typed back another message on the spot. I'm outside the meeting hall. Where are you? Inside. And I think I can see you. Are you the guy with two knives looking at his phone? Not if so. I did nod. The next message was a bit more urgent. Okay, good. 
But before we can find your girl, there's a problem. Do you see anything around you, like a person? I shook my head in response, knowing they could see me. Okay, uh, look, I do. They... they've got too many arms and eyes. Okay, but listen. I can only see them through the window. I poked my head out of the door earlier, and they were gone. But then I checked the window again, and they hadn't moved. So listen closely, okay? I'll guide you here, and we'll be able to find Jenny after. I swallowed and answered in the affirmative. Okay, okay. Take ten steps forward, then stop. There's one right behind you. Don't freak out or anything. It's not looking at you, I think. So, just don't look behind you. Don't do anything that might get its attention. I began walking, counting each step until I reached ten. Great, great, now. There's... Oh shit, one's moving. I can see one moving on your right. Take about five steps to the left now, then go nine steps forward. The moment they typed that, I heard the crunching of grass from my right, then saw some small pieces of gravel kick themselves across the floor. I counted each step again, before taking the nine steps forward. When I stopped, I checked the phone again. Shit, another's moving now. This one's right in front of you, about six steps away. There's another to your left, so go right in a diagonal. I did as instructed, ignoring the shuffling sound just in front of me. I was close enough to the meeting hall now to see a face in one of the windows. Then a hand appeared, palm facing me. I stopped. Can you see me? Of course you can. You're looking right at me. Look, there's about five right in front of you, spread out unevenly. The other two are following after so here's what you need to do. See that fire hydrant? Go towards it. But don't go straight. Make a circle. The fire hydrant in question was about 10 feet on the pavement to my left. And I began moving towards it. Stopping the moment I reached the yellow object. Okay, now keep going straight. But in about 10 steps, make a sharp turn to your right and then just run. I was following their instructions, having just reached 10 steps when they sent another message. Go back. Go back right the fuck now. I did, walking backward, a few good steps, until they told me to stop. I glanced at the face in the window, unable to make out any features. The next message was short, sweet, and simple. Get onto the road, jump over that lamp, then run for the door. Just run! I didn't even need to check twice before doing as they said. Once I vaulted over the lamp, there was a metallic clang behind me as my feet hit the ground, and I broke into a run. I was within a few steps of the door when it happened. The face from the window appearing from it. They were a girl with dark black hair, mouth open and eyes wide as I ran up the steps and pushed past them, slamming the door shut behind me. I couldn't stop breathing, my lungs sore, my broken rib moving slowly against the others, my finger burning with pain. I sighed, then collapsed onto my back and almost closed my eyes until someone slapped me awake. It was a girl with black hair. Hey, buddy, stay awake. Come on, I've got medical supplies in the back. Now move. I stood up as they briskly began walking between the rows of seats, with a kind of confidence I envied. I was walking after them when a thought occurred to me. I don't know your name, I called hoarsely. What is it? They turned back, then sighed. Rosie, she said. Just call me Rosie. I already know yours, Sean. Now, my name's not Sean. Rosie froze, narrowing her eyes at me. I didn't call you Sean. You just did, I answered, gripping my knives. I heard you. Rosie held up her hands. Whoa, just calm down. I'm telling the truth, I swear. Oh, I snarled. Where's Jenny? I don't know. You saw her last. Liar. I snapped, about to break into a run when I got a new message on my phone. And so did Rosie. I tentatively unlocked my phone, never taking my eyes off Rosie, as I checked the message. It was Jenny, or at least someone using Jenny's phone, because Jenny would never have sent this message. That bitch Rosie tried to rape and kill me, it said. She'll do it to you. I glanced back at Rosie, who was holding her phone in hands, with eyes wide. What, what did that message say? That you tried to rape and kill Jenny, I answered calmly, and will do the same to me. Well, Rosie answered, I can assure you I didn't try to do any of that. And my message says you aren't Jenny's boyfriend and that, well, 
that you're going to rape and kill me. The silence stretching between us was like a panther waiting to strike. I glanced at my phone again, and the message from Jenny was gone. I looked back to Rosie, seeing the same expression in her eyes as was doubtless in mine. Then from outside, the silence was broken by pain screams and hoarse yelling as flesh and bone were torn apart. Blood splattered across the window along with a thing with too many eyes and arms. The moment it went quiet, I looked back to Rosie, shocked, until the door slammed open. When I turned around, the person standing there was instantly recognizable. The Mark Bearer, the Wandering Hebrew, Cain.